Hello everyone, this is Sirius Trivia, and today we're continuing our Sun Jian Let's Talk Lore series with episode 2 titled Life of a Soldier. So last episode, we left off at Sun Jian leverages youthful exploits against pirates into a government position. And in the 12 years that followed, Sun Jian would serve as the mayors of three different towns throughout the Yang province, where he would earn a reputation as a caring and charismatic leader. But the good times were short-lived, as when 183 and 184 rolled around, the Zhang brothers from northern China launched the infamous Yellow Turban Rebellion that would engulf most of the country into war. And it was at this time that General Zhu Jun approached Sun Jian, who was the mayor of Xiapi at the time, to recruit him for the army. Now you might wonder, how did Zhu Jun no, Sun Jian even existed. But if we dive a little bit deeper into Zhu Jun's background, we can see that he is from Kuaiji. So it's not actually hard to guess that he would have heard of the exploits of Sun Jian, who is from the nearby town of Fuchun. And don't forget that the rebellion that Sun Jian helped take down was also started in Kuaiji. But despite these hidden webs of connections, Zhu Jun has never actually met or worked with Sun Jian before, so the position that he was offering to him at the time ended up being Zuo Jun Sima, which is the lowest ranking officer in the army, similar to that of a Wu Zhang, who is technically only in charge of five men. But when Sun Jian reported for service, he brought along over a thousand new recruits which included some clan members from the Sun clan and many local youth from the three towns that he were mayors of. Now, while this is a very impressive feat, let's pause for a second and talk about another important aspect of Sun Jian's life during these last 12 years, and that is the family that he now had to take care of. First off, his father, Sun Zhong, who we talked about at length in our last episode, has now passed away. And even his older brother, Sun Qiang, also passed away during this period and left behind two young sons for Sun Jian to help take care of. And with his father and older brother both gone, Sun Jian was now the man of the house, and through his experience in government, he also realized the importance of connections, especially since his clan was at best a second-tier clan in the south. So the best way for him to make these connections was through marriage. And the first marriage that Sun Jian pushed was that of his younger sister, who he married off to the wealthy Xu family, who resided within Fuchun as well. And then he pushed for his own marriage with the much more influential Wu family, who shares the same name as the commandery that they reside in. But before we jump into the story with Lady Wu, let's first take a look at the map to get some reference of the locations that we'll be talking about. So first, on this very difficult to read zoomed out map of all of China, let's first locate Fuchun, which is Sun Jian's hometown, and Shouchun, which is the capital of the Yang province that the Wu commandery is part of. Then. Let's zoom in just to this portion here and add a few new locations. The first one we're going to talk about here is Wuxian, which is the capital of the Wu commandery, and it is slightly northeast of Fuchun, and this would be the hometown of the Wu clan. And Sun Jian was able to get close to this clan because his first mayor post was in a small salt mine town slightly south of Wuxian here. And when he first went to Wu to propose marriage with the Wu clan, the father scorned his advances, as the Sun clan was viewed to be second-rate. And Sun Jian was also viewed by the gentry as this hot-blooded farmer's son who lucked into a government position. Yet despite being spurned, Sun Jian kept at it and visited multiple times to propose marriage repeatedly. And in the end, his reputation of being a hot-blooded and sometimes violent youth actually helped him secure this marriage, as Lady Wu herself 
went to her own parents to basically plead with them that she was willing to sacrifice her own happiness for the safety of their clan, because there were rumors and growing concerns that Sun Jian might flex his government position to secure this marriage through force. Luckily, Lady Wu was rewarded for her decision, as Sun Jian and she got along perfectly fine. And over the course of the next few years, they would produce a total of five offsprings, including four boys and one girl. And by the time Sun Jian was departing to fight the yellow turbans, he would have a total of eight kids split between Lady Wu and a few other concubines. So when Sun Jian resigned from his post as the mayor of Xiapi, his family moved to the capital of the province in Shouchun, and it was also here that the young Sun Ce would meet and become best friends with a young Zhou Yu. But this is a story for another lore series. So now let's go back to talk about Zhu Jun and Sun Jian. Now, for the most part of the Yellow Turban Rebellion, Sun Jian and Zhu Jun will be fighting in the siege of Wancheng, which is also known as Nanyang. And this was probably the toughest fight south of the Yellow River, as the siege itself will last from June to January of 185, as Yellow Turban forces inside the city under the command of first Zhao Hong and then Han Xian held against Zhu Jun's assaults repeatedly. And during this long siege, Sun Jian was known for two major events. The first one took place very early on, before the Yellow Turban forces made up their mind to turtle up inside the city. And in an open field fight outside of Wancheng, Sun Jian was actually badly injured as he was struck off his horse. And all he could do during the chaos of the ensuing battle was to lay motionless on the ground hoping for survival. Luckily, the Han forces eventually won the fight, but the problem was, no one was really out there looking for him, as many would have simply assumed that he had died. However, Sun Jian's horse would end up saving his life, as the horse not only managed to find its way back to camp, but it also helped lead a search party to help locate and find the injured Sun Jian on the battlefield and it took more than half a month to nurse him back to health, but as soon as he was healthy, Sun Jian was once again out there on the front lines, as there were records of him leading charges on ladders, trying to scale the city wall to break the siege, and his valiant efforts and heroism on the battlefield were rewarded when the final victory against the old turbans were secured, as Zhu Jun recommended him to the imperial court, and he was promoted to Bie Bu Sima which was a huge promotion, as he went from someone who was the lowest ranking officer in the army to someone who made just under a thousand dan a year, which is half the salary of one of the nine minister positions at court. But sadly, Sun Jian did not get a chance to really enjoy this promotion, as the Liang Rebellion immediately followed the Yellow Turban Rebellion. And this time, Zhang Wen came knocking, as Sun Jian was recruited to become his army advisor. Now, we have talked about Zhang Wen in many of our previous lore series, including the fall of the Han and Dong Zhuo's story. But in case you forgot, let's quickly go over it again here. Zhang Wen, at this time, was one of the three Grand Excellency positions at the Imperial Court. He has been tasked with putting down the Liang Rebellion, as Dong Zhuo and Huang Fusong's efforts out west have fallen short of the court's expectations. Now, once again, we're going to ask the simple question of how did Zhang Wen even know that Sun Jian existed? And much like the case with Zhu Jun, all we have to do is dig a little deeper to learn that Zhang Wen is actually from Nanyang. And during the long siege, he was instrumental in helping Zhu Jun secure support at court, as there were many eunuchs who clamored for his dismissal due to the lengthy siege. Now, I have to clarify that Zhang Wen is no saint as his in-game background of being the peerless protege refers to the fact that he was the protege of Cao Teng, who is Cao Cao's famous eunuch grandfather, so clearly he was on good terms with the eunuchs. His efforts to help Zhu Jun at court during this siege was not an effort against the eunuchs, but rather a practical choice to save his own hometown. So there's no doubt he heard of this fearless commander on the battlefield, who once again received glowing reviews and a huge promotion. So now we know how he was picked, 
But the sad news for Sun Jian is he didn't even get to have a break to go home to see his family as he sets off once again for the northwestern frontiers alongside Zhang Wen. And to not repeat ourselves too much, as we have already covered this story in two of our previous lore series, Sun Jian would give out two key advice in this campaign in his role as the military advisor. And the first advice was to Zhang Wen himself, as he argued that Dong Zhuo should be executed for snubbing Zhang Wen by not showing up to the first military meeting on the first day of the army's arrival. His argument here is that Dong Zhuo was clearly a failure to begin with as his job to put down the rebellion has failed and now he is leveraging his familiarity with the area to bargain with Zhang Wen who is his direct commander. Thus by military law, Dong Zhuo should be executed for not showing up to the meeting and it will help show the army who is really in charge. Unfortunately, Zhang Wen who is not a military man, did not take Sun Jian's advice here, and we know what will eventually happen afterwards. Sun Jian's second advice on this campaign was for Zhou Shen, who was a general that Zhang Wen sent to chase after the fleeing rebel forces after a timely meter shower helped spook the town forces into retreating. Here, Sun Jian argues that their small pursuit force cannot actually siege the city so their only hope was to divide up their force to cut off the enemy supplies that were entering the city through the waterway. But despite offering to lead this team to cut off supplies himself, Sun Jian's advice here was once again ignored as Zhou Shen was worried that dividing their already small force was not the way to go against the defensive Beigong Boyu. But Zhou Shen's analysis here turned out to be wrong, as Beigong Boyu was not content in passively defending the city, as he actually sent out small cavalry detachments to cut off Zhou Shen and Sun Jian's supplies instead. And before long, without steady supplies, the Han army were defeated, and Zhang Wen's entire campaign was doomed as five of the six pursuit teams that he sent out were all wiped, and the only force that remained was Dong Zhuo's group who had managed to escape in one piece. But fortunately, being the peerless protege of the great eunuch, Cao Teng, Zhang Wen knew how to bribe the courts to save himself, and instead of receiving a punishment, Zhang Wen actually managed to secure a promotion to Grand Commandant. And because Zhang Wen wasn't punished, Sun Jian was also spared, as he was reassigned as Yi Lang, which is basically a court advisor that works closely with the minister herald. And although this position pays less at only around 600 dan a year, it was a lot closer to power. And we'll see in our next episode titled Going Back South of how Sun Jian was able to leverage both his experiences in the army and his new position in court to secure a ticket to become the administrator of Changsha. So with this, we'll conclude our episode here. Hope you guys enjoyed this one, and see you all next time. Bye!